Hi, and welcome to lesson one on overview of quantum communications. In this lesson, we will give you an overview of how communication evolved over the many thousands of years. Then we will tell you a little bit about sending signals uh, between parties of a network. Uh, we will give you the difference and similarities between uh, digital and analog signals. And then we will introduce the uh, fundamental building block of modern communication, that is the bit. After that, we'll move on to quantum communication and tell you why you should care about it, what's new that it brings to the table, and what are the new challenges that face us in designing uh, quantum communication devices and protocols. Uh, and then we will uh, move on to the disruptive nature of quantum technologies and quantum communication in particular. We will conclude this lesson by giving you an overview of the entire module and what are the prerequisites uh, and uh, what you will learn and what are the outcomes of the module. Okay, so let's move on to step one. The history of communication. So methods of communication advanced uh, in order to accommodate a growing society. Uh, and sometimes a growing society, um, new technological advances in the society allow the society to grow and expand. So because humans are social, social creatures, we always gather together and we uh, felt the need to communicate. But not only, because, not only because that's our nature, but also because it allowed our survival. In particular, it was very important to share information about potential new sources of food, uh, potential sources of danger. So, how people did it is they gathered around a fire and they talked to each other. And somehow, over the many thousands of years, the methods of communication evolved, they became more efficient, they became more long distance, until we finally reached our modern age, where basically every device that we have in our possession, our phones, uh, our TVs, our iPads, even our fridges, they're all connected to one single network, the internet. So basically, even though we are separated by many thousands of kilometers, it almost feels as if everybody can communicate directly to anybody else, regardless of where actually they're located on our planet. So we went from local communication to a truly global communication. So let's see how that happened. In the next couple of slides, you're going to see some famous examples from history and uh, many different ways of in which we communicated. So the most obvious way is to actually just take your message, write it on a piece of paper and send the message directly. A very uh, uh, famous example is uh, the Battle of Marathon, where the legend goes that actually a runner was sent from where the battle took place near the city of Marathon to Athens, but that's historically actually not true. What happens was that the uh, Athenians were trying to uh, uh, gain support of the uh, army from the city of Sparta, so they had to send a runner to uh, uh, deliver this message. And the distance between the cities is 225 kilometers, and that journey, believe it or not, took uh, a little bit uh, uh, less than a day. So that's pretty impressive. Another method of sending a message directly is actually using birds, in particular uh, homing pigeons. So these are pigeons that are specially trained to re always return to their home, their coop. So what people used to do is they would put them in cages when they were traveling somewhere and whenever they needed to send a message back home they would take a little parchment of paper, write the message down, attach it to the pigeon's uh, leg and just let the pigeon go and the pigeon would automatically fly back and deliver the message. And the range of these birds was around 1600 kilometers, so that's quite impressive. And the average speed was around 95 kilometers per hour. But the top speed of uh, some very athletic pigeons was uh, upwards of 160 kilometers uh, per hour, for, but only for short distances. Another example of uh, sending the messages directly is the Pony Express. So this was a company set up in the uh, uh, early US that connected the East and West Coast. So if you were on the East Coast and you wanted to send a letter to somebody in the West Coast, well, you went to this company and then they would send a, a horse rider who would actually deliver your message. And how it worked, he would uh, take the horse, go to some relay station, change to a fresh horse and continue with your message onwards. And believe it or not, the entire journey of 4,000 kilometers took approximately 10 days. So uh, in the context of the communication speeds at the time, this was very, very fast. 
And not only could you send letters, but you could also send some small parcels. So it was the very early Amazon. But despite how successful the company was, it only existed for one year. And we will see later why that is. And that's because the method of communication changed from direct transmission to telegraphy, in particular electrical te telegraphy. But before we get to that, let's talk about different ways of sending a message. Because sending the message directly is generally relatively slow and there are reliability issues. You may lose your pigeon, your runner can actually get exhausted and die or just give up his task. So you have to find different ways of uh, sending messages. One such way is using optical telegraphy. So this relies on you as the sender and the receiver sharing some uh, pre-agreed signals. And then you have to use some optical method in order to generate these signals such that the recipient can see them. A very good example is the Great Wall of China, which was designed and built uh, to protect the northern border of the Chinese Empire. And how it worked was that there were these series of guard towers represented by these circles on the wall. And whenever there was uh, some threat approaching, the enemy was trying to attack the wall, let's say at this point over here that guard tower would light a fire. This fire was then observed from its neighboring guard towers, which were approximately two and a half to five kilometers apart. And then they would uh, light their fires. Then their neighbors would see that and light their fires. And this is how the message spread across large portions of the wall. And it could do it in fact very, very quickly. One drawback of this method is that uh, the expressibility of the language is uh, limited. You can only send certain messages. For example, uh, the enemy is here or it's not. The fire is on or it's not. Or you can uh, develop this method a little bit more and have two fires. For example, when one fire is on, uh, the enemy is there. But in small numbers, when two fires on, the enemy is there in large numbers. But for the purposes uh, um, of defending the wall, this system was actually very efficient and served them really well. Another way of optical telegraphy is known as Napoleon semaphore. And this, uh, this system was a lot more expressive. In fact, how it worked was you had these uh, crane arms, which you could arrange at a certain, uh, certain given angles. And the, inside this house, there was uh, an operator who would operate uh, levers and pulleys to arrange these arms uh, at certain angles. And each angle, each configuration of the arms had its own meaning. For example, this configuration that you can see here was the, for letter A. And this network of uh, semaphores spanned all of France, or at least uh, the most important cities. So for example, you could send a message from uh, Paris all the way down to Venice. And this is quite far um, in terms of sending a, sending a, a horse uh, or delivering the, mm, uh, the message directly. But with the semaphore, it only took a few hours. And in fact, the record was uh, uh, between Paris and uh, Strasbourg here uh, in the east of France on the border with Germany. And that message only took one hour to reach Strasbourg. But as you, as you can imagine, there were some drawbacks of this method. In particular, you had to have a direct visual contact uh, uh, with your neighboring semaphore. So it only worked in good weather and during daytime. And on top of that, even though you could express an arbitrary uh, message using this method, it was very difficult, physically difficult, to actually operate these semaphores. So that brings us finally to electrical telegraphy and the invention of Morse code and uh, uh, that used electric signals to transmit messages. How that works is you have this very new abstract alphabet, which consists of only two symbols, a dot and a line. So basically a short pulse and a long pulse. And uh, using that and using this vocabulary, you could express any message that you wanted. And how it worked was that there was an operator who would uh, uh, operate a Morse key which was basically a switch in an electrical circuit. And when the operator pressed on the key, this would close the circuit and there would be a signal generated. When it closed it for a short time, the signal would be short. If they closed it for a long time, the signal would be long. And this method allowed for very quick and efficient uh, transmission of messages. It could span continents in a matter of minutes. 
And also, this was the method that actually killed Pony Express and Napoleon Semaphore. On the other hand, not everybody could use uh, uh, this method uh, at any time they chose to. They had to go to a, sp uh, a special service, special company, that they had trained operators that would encode and decode your messages into the Morse code. Finally, then uh, the electrical telegraph um, led way to gave way to telephone, which uh, implemented the dream of uh, communication between humans, and that was transmission of human voice. So at first, uh, the connections were just point to point, but as the popularity of the telephone grew, there were many more connections required, so the networks were getting uh, uh, larger. So the solution was to build a switchboard to which all the, all the telephones would be connected, and then you would first call the switchboard, the switchboard would uh, uh, connect you to your desired recipient, and then establish a connection that way. And eventually, as the more and more people were uh, starting to use telephones, the different networks of uh, uh, telephones had to get interconnected uh, between each other, creating a first global network. And that leads us to where we are today. Today, we have the internet, which is a globe-spanning network of networks, meaning that there are many different heterogeneous networks all connected to each other. So if you are using your phone, maybe you are connected to some telco tower, which then relays the signal uh, through the internet to wherever uh, you wish. Also, our computers are connected to uh, modems via Wi-Fi, then the, these modems are connected to the internet uh, via Ethernet cables. And basically, everything is connected nowadays. We consume uh, voice and video, entertainment and news, and virtually we have access to any form of information that we wish to. And it's uh, uh, within a very short, brief uh, time. So this image of internet is actually quite a simplification. In reality, what it looks like, it's more like this. So this rather confusing looking blob is a representation of uh, the virtual connections between networks. So each of these little dots, they don't represent physical machines, they represent smaller networks. So you can see how complicated uh, 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 the routing in the internet actually is. And this picture is about 20 years old, so nowadays probably it might look something a little bit even more impressive. So we have started with people gathering around campfires and sharing information to having a truly global uh, internet. But for us, this is only where the journey begins. In this course, we will tell you what lies beyond the classical internet, what are the necessary tools to get there, and what are the challenges that face us.